Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with Grid Beyond, where we'll be discussing how to manage utility scale battery storage assets, a major player in the global energy transition. I'm Andy Colthorpe, editor of Energy Storage News here at Solar Media. Grid scale battery storage is a fascinating technology. At its heart, it's pretty simple put enough battery cells into modules to reach the megawatt and megawatt hour scale you need, put those in racks, combine them with power conversion systems, energy management systems, thermal management and safety, and there you are. Well, of course, it isn't as simple as that. Putting together the hardware with the system software, as I've described in quite a basic way, is in itself complex system integration work. On the other side of that, the key to making battery storage assets tick in a growing number of markets is how they operate within those markets and how they earn revenues. That's where optimizers like Grid Beyond come in. As you'll hear from today's speakers, optimizers use a combination of advanced technologies, rich data sets and human know-how to deliver the maximum value from battery storage systems all while ensuring those systems have a long and healthy life in the field. With a strong track record in the UK and Ireland markets, Grid Beyond has taken its expertise to new territories, including Europe, Australia, Japan, and the US, the latter with a focus on the booming ERCOT market in Texas. We'll learn today how the company does that what the technologies and strategies are behind making the assets work smart and work hard at the same time. And we will also get a bit of a flavor of how the opportunities for batteries have evolved and are evolving all the time. Joining us today, uh, speakers are Wayne Moncaster, who is Grid Beyond's SVP for North America, Paul Conlon, Head of Modeling and Forecasting, and Seamus King, uh, head of trading at Grid Beyond. In today's webinar, we will start off with brief presentations from each speaker. We'll follow that up with a panel discussion on some of the key points uh, which I'll be moderating. And of course, as always, interaction with you, the audience, is really important to us. And we welcome and encourage you to submit your questions for the speakers ahead of the Q&A session at the end of that panel discussion. And you can put your questions into the questions tab on the right hand side of your screen. And finally, before we get started, today's session is being recorded and slides will be sent to registered attendees. And thank you. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker. Over to you, Wayne. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> thank you very much and, uh, and welcome, everybody. And thank you for attending. Um, it's great to talk to you and great to see so many of you on the on the webinar today. I'm going to very, very briefly cover an overview of Grid Beyond who we are and, and, and what we do and, and add some um, a little bit more flavour to, to Andy's kind introduction um, before I hand over to, to, to Paul and, and, and Seamus to, to get into the more detail around our long term, short term forecasting and our trading optimization battery storage. So um, for those of you that, that, that haven't met with Grid Beyond before, and I, I do see a number of you that I've, that I've met um, on both sides of the Atlantic on the, on the webinar, which is always great. But for those of you who don't know Grid Beyond, uh, as, uh, as Andy said, we operate um, in markets across North America and Europe, where we started in, in Ireland back in 2008, um, managing flexible assets in, in, in energy markets, um, and latterly Australia and Japan over the last um, 12 or 18 months as, as market development. So um, what all those markets have in common are challenges, um, renewable penetration, battery storage penetration, challenges around frequency management, balancing supply and demand, and all price volatility. Um, and that's where our services come to the fore in, in, in managing flexible assets, be they load, demand load in commercial industrial businesses, be they distributed generation or since 2016, large and small scale um, battery storage, utility and commercial industrial behind the battery storage. Um, we've got around 15, 1600 megawatts of, of, of capacity under management at any one time across those markets that I mentioned, um, around 400 megawatts or 25 percent of that is is battery storage. Um, there are not many people in the market that can say they've been optimizing batteries for, for large scale battery storage for seven years that we have. We started at the back end of 2016 with the, with the growth in the, in the UK market. 
um, and as Andy said, we're now bringing that experience, I've brought that experience over, over to the US. We're based out of Houston, so it's ERCOT is our core market and our home market, but we also operate across um, PJM, MISO and SPP for the demand response um, and we're opening markets in California and Ontario for battery storage. We have now over 30 individual assets and we're, we're, we're adding more and more assets each month as we, as we grow the pipeline and the business that we've got in battery storage. And as I've said previously, those 30-ish those um, individual assets account for about 400 megawatts of contracted batteries. There are, there are quite a few of those that are um, anything from 100 kilowatts to 10 megawatts behind the meter batteries. And then we've got our utility scale business as well. In terms of what we offer um, to, to the marketplace on, on both sides of the, of, the, of the Atlantic and now into the Australian Japanese markets, we split that down into um, forecast and design, so long-term forecast analysis of, 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 of long-term revenues, location analysis, so looking at nodal pricing in Texas, for example, and, and comparisons of, of, of where to where best to site battery storage. So that forecast and, and, and design element of our business is, is, is going to be covered by Paul um, in, in the very next section. Um, energy management systems, be they um, light systems, so integrating into existing EMS systems and, and augmenting existing controls, or be they full EMS systems that we use on our own funded battery offering. Um, we offer control, um, and then uh, on the optimization side, there are two ways that we can uh, we can optimize batteries, either through our trading as a service, which is effectively a fully outsourced trading and optimization service, or through the use of, of that same software um, as a software as a service um, provision for optimization. But that's going to be covered in more detail in, in Seamus' section. Um, and just to complete, that the, the reason we've done this, as I said, we manage our own batteries. We understand um, what it takes to, 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 to optimize and, and maximize revenues through batteries in marketplace. And that, that link between looking at long-term forecast and design um, through control of, a, of an asset into that short-term market and, and physical optimization day ahead, in day, um, is kind of critical to, to our experience and the way that we approach um, the marketplace with, with others as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul and let him, uh, let him talk to you about our, our modeling and forecasting function. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Uh, so good afternoon, good morning, everyone, depending on where you're located. My name is Paul Conlon, as Wayne said. I'm the head of modeling and forecasting at Grid Beyond. I've uh, been with the company in just under one year. Came out of 15 plus years in a utility uh, company in the asset development side and tra energy trading side, uh, where we traded a portfolio of assets in the UK and Irish energy markets, covering, I suppose, a mixed bag of assets from coal, gas, wind, solar, hydro, and in the latter stages, batteries, uh, which led me into my current position. So I'm going to give a, a brief overview of our approach to valuing distributed energy assets and also provide some insights from our models and what we believe is driving value for flexible assets and specifically battery storage. So this slide here is just really to give a high level overview of our approach to evaluating prospective investments in energy markets. This can get very uh, technical and very nerdy very quickly. Uh, so I'll try and keep it light in, in everyone's interest. Um, but in essence, we have a two-stage process to our modeling. On the left-hand side is the price forecasting side of the house. And then it finishes up on the right-hand side with a projection of financial returns that are maximized against all available revenue streams. So it's particularly important for battery storage where revenue stacking across different market, markets helps us uh, maximize returns. It also makes life a lot more complicated for the asset owner uh, or the project developer and energy trader, where life was once about primarily trading in a day ahead energy market and maybe with fine tune adjustments intraday or in real time markets. Battery storage in particular cuts its teeth across multiple markets and multiple timeframes. And that makes the decision making process about where to place these assets uh, a little bit trickier. So we'll just go a little bit deeper into each of those uh, two stages. So first of all, on the left-hand side, regarding price forecasting, we produce long-term 10 or 15 year price forecasts that are driven by fundamental macro assumptions. Things like demand, install capacity, whatever levels of wind and solar thermal batteries we expect to be on the grid at points in the future. Fuel prices are all factors that feed into the, into the price for, forecasting models. Um, and they, these models employ 
artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques that have been trained on historic market outcomes and tailored to the specific rules of, of each market that we're, we're trying to forecast, whether that be day ahead, intraday real time, or the ancillary services markets and where they exist capacity markets as well. So these machine learning techniques, I suppose I, I cut my teeth on a background of fundamental modeling. Um, machine learning is a bit different from that. It allows us to capture pricing dynamics that are observed in the market. Uh, and this is particularly useful when you have prices that move above short run marginal costs and cost of production, which we expect to become more and more prevalent uh, as we head towards net zero carbon economies and growing renewables on our systems. Um, and in, in tandem with that, we expect to see uh, system stress events occurring more often. And just in general, market volatility become more commonplace. So these machine learning techniques are, are really good at capturing the patterns uh, that it sees in the market in line with the interactions of the various uh, input variables. And I'd also add that the granularity of these forecasts reflect whatever market we're trying to predict. So they range from hourly down to the five minute level. And it's absolutely necessary for energy asset valuation these days where a model needs to cap capture the intertemporal nature of prices driven by now what is primarily the interaction between intermittent renewables, demand at any time of the day, and then the availability of thermal plant and in particular gas prices within that. So as well as employing these machine learning techniques, uh, it allows us to generate probabilistic forecasts, let's call it. Um, and that's helpful in addressing what is the inherent uncertainty in energy markets and the increased risk that investors uh, see. Uh, and this is again becoming more and more prevalent as energy markets are increasingly driven by weather factors as the level of intermittent renewables like wind and solar come on the system. So in that regard, we don't provide a deterministic forecast. It's not a single uh, forecast. It, uh, our, our probabilistic forecasting techniques provide a range of possible outcomes, and that ensures we can capture uh, the potential extremes of pricing outcomes and value uh, associated with increasingly volatile energy markets. So that's that's the, the pricing side of the house. Uh, the next stage in the process is, is to take all those prices as an input to an optimization engine. Uh, and this engine seeks to dispatch the asset, whatever it may be, but particularly battery storage assets, uh, into the most appropriate market in order to maximize the return on the asset. It runs this optimi optimization across a 24 hour window and across the forecast period over 10 or 15 years. So you can imagine that's uh, quite a complex uh, problem that it's trying to solve, a huge amount of processing, optimizing the dispatch at anything down to a five minute time frame on a daily basis for up to 15 years. So it's a significant problem to solve, and that's why we use these um, this mathematical optimization techniques. Uh, and I should add, this part of the model also takes as an input project specific factors, uh, which is back over on the on the left hand side as as an input. So these are gonna, can include factors like if there's a, a load source on site, efficiency of the batteries, um, battery cycle constraints, and then as well where we might have co located renewable generation, uh, and other factors like capital costs, etc. So it's tailored to the specific aspects of, of uh, any individual project. And then as I, as I alluded to at the start, what is produced out of this is a set of uh, price forecasts, the market intelligence that that also provides, and a financial appraisal of the investment with cash flows, margins, et cetera, and what we hope to be a, a set of bankable re results for our customers. So I'll just go into, just to give a bit more detail on what that optimization uh, problem is trying to solve. So this is just a diagrammatic overview of a particular case where we have uh, a battery storage uh, site uh, co-located with a wind or a solar farm. So uh, uh, intermittent generation It's connected to the grid so it can import and export through the MIC or the MEC route. And it also has um, the opportunity to participate in uh, frequency markets. In this case, these are the frequency markets operating there, caught the uh, RRS, non-spin, and reg up and reg down. So the decision that the, the computer has to make, that, and, and I should say that this is something that 
has to be replicated uh, at the trading stage, even though this is a, a long-term investment model. It's a similar kind of decision-making process that a trader would have to go through on a, on a day by day or hour by hour basis if it wanted to uh, trade these assets. So the model has the option to sell the wind farm output into the day ahead or a real time market, store some of that wind generation into the battery if prices aren't favorable in the energy markets at that time, or if there's curtailment or constraints occurring on the network. Uh, it also has the option of buying power directly from the grid and storing it in the battery uh, and selling it back to the grid, depending on, on what price is doing at any point in time. And that's a pure arbitrage play. play. Uh, and then finally, it has the decision of whether it needs to participate into uh, the frequency markets at any point in time. Uh, so, and the other decision it has, it could do all of the above. So uh, it's, it's quite a complex decision-making process. And I should also add, it has to do all that within specific constraints that can be applied to the uh, asset and they might be by battery cycle constraints, state of charge limits on the battery, uh, maximum import or export limits to the grid. So I hope this demonstrates in a, in a rather simplistic way that that's the kind of decision making process that's required to optimize the return on the asset. And in this case, while it's being played out over a 10 or 15 year forecast, as we do in these long term uh, business case models, when it comes to trading batteries in the energy market, that's exactly the same kind of decision process that a trader needs to employ, but on a much shorter time scale, maybe one or two days ahead, down to much closer to real time. So it's not really the kind of problem that a human can solve easily and really does lend itself to the kind of machine learning, mathematical optimization techniques that I, I discussed. So I'm just gonna move on to now to, uh, just to give a brief overview of what we are seeing in terms of uh, some of our insights from our ERCOT uh, modeling. Uh, we also provide these models in, in other markets with other ISOs in, in North America. So looking at ERCOT here, this is probably a well-worn story across many energy markets at this stage. What we see is significant growth in renewables, thermal plant closures, particularly in coal, very limited growth in gas fire generation. In this case here, we're showing slight growth over, over the period. Uh, and coupled with in increasing demand growth, as is evident in the chart on the top right. So in general, this results in markets that are increasingly driven by weather and the randomness that that brings, and this leads to greater volatility. And this is where we see opportunity for battery storage. Uh, and as I touched on, battery storage makes its money from volatile conditions, indicative of high levels of intermittent generation, technologies driving uh, some of that price volatility. But it's not just about price volatility, as we uh, as I discussed on the previous slide. As renewables grow, the network becomes harder to manage from an ISO or grid stability point of view. And this increases the need for ancillary services, such as reserves and frequency markets. And in fact, those ancillary service markets have been the mainstay of battery business cases to date, but that may not last forever. The markets are quite shallow uh, which means that they can get saturated very quickly and that will ultimately lead to prices falling. So they also earn their income from uh, the, the price volatility that I touched on, the spread between the high peak prices and the low nighttime prices. And the greater that spread, the, the better the, the value that we see for batteries. And this is indicative of what I've shown here on this next slide. This is somewhat stylized, uh, but in general, what we're seeing from our models is that as renewables come on the system, uh, peak prices get higher uh, or peakier, as I like to call it, and the lower prices get lower. Uh, and this is what we expect as the fundamentals in the market shift to more volatile, intermittent weather driven uh, events uh, with zero marginal cost generators, generation becoming more and more prevalent in the markets. And you can see this on, on, the, on the chart on the left here, the kind of red and orange dots are what we see at the the peak prices, the top one R or top two R prices in the market. And they, they increase as we go out to 2035. At the same time, the lowest prices in the market, say the nighttime prices, levels of high wind, uh, they, they start to fall. At a point they, they uh, level out as demand starts to kick in when we get the likes of hydrogen, maybe cryptocurrency mining kicking in and increasing demand at night. 
so that's the kind of uh, price volatility we expect. This is just shown as well on the right-hand side from a, a daily price profile point of view. Uh, so you'll see the, the peak periods up in the evening here are getting much higher. Uh, we also have the impact of solar generation coming online, depressing prices, or that cannibalization effect of, of renewables, depressing uh, prices during the day. And countering that impact, we should also see batteries coming into play to soften some of the impacts of higher peak prices than would otherwise have been the case. And on top of that, where we see lots of charging happening at nighttime uh, from, from those batteries, that, that should drive prices up in, in the evening. So there, there is a dampening effect of, of batteries coming online, but I think the, the inflow of renewables in comparison to the, the volume of, of batteries is, is much more greater. So that really covers all I have to say. Um, I'll just leave you with an overview of the kind of output that we produce from, from this kind of analysis, this uh, investment case uh, appraisal for battery storage or indeed any kind of distributed energy, energy assets. Um, it ranges from, like I touched on, probabilistic forecasts, so you get a suite of, of uh, prices with confidence levels, uh, to an assessment, as you see here on the bottom left, of capital costs based on a range of sizing options. We were on optimal sizing analysis, so feeding those uh, range of, of battery sizes with varying capital costs to get the optimal size for each particular case, uh, maximizing the return on that. And then ultimately, as we see on the bottom right, a, a projection of revenues or gross margins broken down by uh, the given revenue source, frequency, energy arbitrage, or in some cases, capacity. So I hope that gives a, a, a brief and a light overview of what we do on long-term modeling and optimization side of, of our business. Um, so I'll hand you over to Seamus now, and he'll show you how essentially that same challenge plays out for a trader on a short-term basis uh, via our trading platform. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to meet you. My name is Seamus King. I'm the head of trading at, at Grid Beyond. I've been working for Grid Beyond for a little over 18 months now, managing our 24-7, 365 trading desk, trading all of our, our jurisdictions. Um, my area of experience is short-term trading, um, day real-time markets trading, power and gas, power portfolio, consisting of coal, CCGTs, home storage, hydro, wind, um, and a gas uh, generation um, assets. So I just have a few slides here to talk through the more term of, of um battery assets so just to kind of give you a bit of history around kind of where we came from um you know our, our business is primarily uh or originally was ireland ngb now moving into markets in the us and further afield why do we need to why do we feel the need to start to look at uh, optimization of battery assets uh, and this example is just calling out kind of the situ situation we find ourselves G the past, up until September of 2021, we would have had um, wholesale trading markets, which would have been reasonably stable. Um, we would have had one frequency market, dynamic containment, uh, which was procured daily, uh, and the price was fixed. So the optimization between that energy market and the frequency market was reasonably straightforward. Uh, where we find ourselves at present, Obviously, wholesale markets have become increasingly volatile. Uh, we have three frequency services, uh, dynamic containment, dynamic moderation, dynamic regulation, each with different levels of response, different response parameters in terms of speed of response, duration of response. They're each procured in four hourly blocks and the price is no longer fixed. So the optimization of a battery asset across all of these markets um, has become increasingly difficult and where we're going in the future you know we're definitely moving to hourly if not half hourly products and the markets the energy markets are only getting more volatile so the optimization of a battery asset across these markets and the same can be said for any of the of the new markets we look at ERCOS, australia japan um optimization across the markets is becoming more granular and more difficult and it's becoming increasingly uh, difficult for a human to do it without sophisticated software. So that's where our optimization capability and our, our trading cockpit uh, 
comes into play. So where is energy trading going? Um, I guess in the past, more of a classical trading, I guess very orientated on the day ahead market, um, very manual from the trader's perspective, trading on the big spreads only. So the clear and obvious opportunities between potentially overcharging um, charging overnight and discharging over the peaks. But where it's going now is introducing increased forecasting. So that's more forecasts for intraday auctions, real-time balancing mechanisms, uh, more forecasts for ancillary services, which allows trading desks to optimize financially and physically. So financially, uh, further optimization is trading in all the markets. Um, and it's trading on every opportunity, not only the clear and obvious spreads between the, the overnight and the peaks, but also on those shoulder opportunities as well. And to do that, you know, you need uh, technical support, you need an application to, to help you do a lot of the heavy lifting and the role of the trader becomes oversight, supervisory, and kind of confirmation of strategies for, for a trading day. That being the financial side of the house, these are obviously physical assets as well considerations such as cycles under warranty, typically governed by your agreement with your manufacturer. A battery would probably only be able to cycle a number of times a day, one, two, three times a day while still being under warranty. That needs to be a consideration. We need to manage the state of health over the investment cycle. And there are a number of things that you can do to manage the state of health. One of them being limit, limiting state of charge, you know, charging a battery fully, discharging it fully, severely degrades the, the lifetime of a battery. So that also becomes a consideration in the optimization. A battery has a power rating, it also has a capacity rating, import export connections. Um, you know, you might only be allowed to consume so much from the grid or export so much from the grid in megawatts at any point in time, which could limit the op optimization. And we also have efficiency losses to consider. So what you charge, what you put into the battery to charge the asset won't be exactly what you get out on the other side. There will be some efficiency losses to so a uh, consideration so it's not only it's not until we look at the financial optimization and the physical optimization of the asset that we get that full suite um, and we maximize the value that we're getting uh, from a battery asset what does this look like um do you know these power markets they don't sleep they're they're 24 7 365 the process would be receive energy price forecasts, day ahead market, real-time market, ancillary services forecasts, RRS, reg up, reg down, asset parameters, power capacity, import export, cyclic efficiency losses, state of charge limits, trading strategies. So you know, these can go, go the whole way from a high level trading strategy uh, where you're choosing um, markets, uh, energy ancillary services, the whole way down to individual price or volume strategies uh, and kind of how you want to align the solver with your risk appetite. They would all run through an ensemble of machine learning algorithms to output on the other side an optimized set of bids and offers for whatever market you're looking at. And this kind of presents the natural gate for the trader to, to step in, appraise what's being suggested by the application, make some changes, uh, volumes, prices before submitting out to the market. Market access through APIs, bids and offers go out, trades come back. Those trades will never be the same as what went out in the bid and offer. So that triggers a position management uh, function and this becomes iterative. So once you move from a day ahead market, you might be moving into an intraday option. You might be moving into a real-time market in ERCOT. The optimization becomes iterative. It positions update, uh, your optimized solution needs to be revised and your strategy may change for, for the next, next settlement period or the, the next auction that you're looking at. So in terms of the battery economic dispatch problem, so I guess these are few limited resources in the sense that you only have so many megawatt hours to, to trade at any one time. They're not like a, a CGGG that you can just turn on and leave on for months. Uh, you need to, um, choose when and where you trade the asset. So the optimization problem becomes two-dimensional. So not only can do you need to choose 
which market you want to transact in at any point in time, but you also need to choose um, what time you do you do that. So do you sell power into the day ahead market now, or do we sell power into the real-time market later? So it becomes a two-dimensional arbitrage, one across the markets and two temporally with time. So we need to decide when to trade, where to trade and what price. And it's choosing the right market at the, at the right time, which your volume at the right price is how you really um, maximize the value you get uh, out of an asset such as, a, such as an energy storage asset. So that brings me to the end of my slides. Um, I might use this opportunity to tag Andy back in to open the panel discussion. And um, thanks very much for, for listening to us. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Seamus, uh, Paul and Wayne. Um, apologies for the uh, slight um, technical difficulties. I think with Seamus's audio, I hope everyone was able to uh, catch certainly the main um, gist of what was being uh, talked about. Uh, that said, we've got lots of great questions coming from the audience already, so we'll look forward to getting to those, but we'll kick off with the panel discussion portion. Uh, and I think a nice gentle way to ease you guys into this is to ask that, you know, we've heard, or rather I've heard um, from my reporting um, for Energy Storage News, uh, from quite a few US companies, a couple of things to the effect that not only is the UK market kind of similar to ERCOT in Texas in terms of being increasingly based around merchant revenues, uh, but also at the same time that the optimization space in the UK has become quite advanced. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are uh, on that. Uh, and I guess Seamus, since you were last, last to speak, maybe you want to be first to come in with the answer in it on this one. Sure, yeah. The, um, yeah, I guess the, the UK market is very advanced in terms of its, its optimization space. Um, and the reason being, it's a very transparent market. Um, you know, we, we can see at any point in time, the markets um, that a battery is in, be it ancillary or energy, what volume and at what price. Um, it's even so transparent that there are leaderboards that uh, you can see how well optimizers are performing. So it's the transparency that's driven competition. It's a very, very competitive market. There's nowhere to hide. And that competition has driven very sophisticated uh, solutions, optimization solutions um, that have been built uh, originating from um, the UK. Um, so we, you can see uh, other optimizers trading strategies, how they're performing, the markets that they're, they're in, um, which kind of informs how you might Im improve your own models. So it's the, the, the solutions that are coming out of the GB market, GB market are very sophisticated and they're coming to the ERCOT market. So there's a lot of similarities um, in the ERCOT market to GB. They had real-time energy, uh, reg up, reg down, up, up and down frequency services, reserve services. So the optimization can be leveraged for, for ERCOT. So that's why we're seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, optimizers come to uh, the ERCOT market because of that similarity. Okay, thanks. That's, I mean, that's interesting to hear, Seamus. I mean, I'm just wondering, you know, maybe we can kill two birds with one stone here because we had a little bit of a question from the audience on, on this as well, from Michael Sanzo, asking what do you think the biggest challenge is to go from the UK to the ERCOT market? Uh, Wayne, I don't know if you could maybe just give us a quick, uh, um, yeah, yes. quick overview on that, if that's a fair question. No, absolutely. I guess with 23 years in the UK market and now four years in the in the, in the ERCOT market, then I'm, 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 I'm at least partly qualified to kind of do a comparison, right? So, um, so no, from my perspective, I think the biggest challenge here is, you know, the UK, the UK market, when we started in this in 2016, has gone through an inordinate amount of change. I think we're on our seventh different frequency response or regulation service in, in that kind of six years and, and, and constantly kind of changing and developing services, which, which creates a huge challenge. Um, and I think, I think that's that's playing out already in Texas, obviously mainly driven by Winter Storm Uri and some of the some of the changes that have gone through the PUCT and, and, and now the Senate over here, you know, still up for debate, still lots of uncertainty around the market. Um, and as a as a system operator gets gets to grips with with batteries, that that creates challenges for battery owners and, and optimizers like Grid Beyond. So I think there's that challenge to come in Texas, and that, that's perhaps one of the bigger challenges. And and what I see and what I what I feel is that within within ERCOT, that kind of six seven years of transition is probably going to be compressed into 
12, 18 months, two years of, of, of kind of development, looking at the scale of the pipelines that are coming through. So undoubtedly that, you know, not just the volatility that's in the market itself, but the volatility created by changes that, that are necessary within the market to accommodate these new assets, creates an environment where um, you know, that kind of constant change needs to be needs to be monitored and, 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 and modeled and then impacted into your trading strategy. In other words, you're always kind of at or ahead of the curve as those new programs and services and the changes and within them take effect. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I think, think what I think I can kind of add to that, Andy. But, sure. um, yeah, the, the last point that Wayne made there is very, very true. Um, kind of ERCOT is a very spiky market, and you know, we've seen some exceptionally high prices occur for, for, dif for different reasons, and positioning yourself to take advantage of those. Um, is you know key and will be you know a, a big challenge and um, forecasting of price of the a, a nodal market these solvers and solutions we talk about typically your performance is governed by how good your forecasts are you know, they'll always solve the problem optimally but that's only if the forecasts are telling them are, are accurate so you know getting your forecasting right uh, getting it to a reasonable level, level of accuracy will ensure uh, good performance. So, from a short term perspective, uh, that is a big challenge. Okay, terrific. I mean, maybe we'll look in, into a bit more uh, detail on some of that, you know, the modeling and forecasting, um, you know, as we go through this. But, um, you know, I think you mentioned the winter storm, Yuri Wayne, and, you know, that was something that was obviously top of mind um, for a lot of people. And it brought questions of grid and energy system resiliency uh, to top of mind for a lot of people. At the same time, it was a stark reminder of the climate crisis and perhaps how events, uh, not exactly like this, but events uh, of this type are happening much more frequently than before. And Paul, I think you referred to, you know, increasingly weather driven energy systems. So just wonder what events tell us like this about the evolving need for resources like energy storage. And maybe if you could just uh, elaborate a little bit on that, you know, how the, the kind of weather driven Kind of uh, balancing act if you will is is kind of playing out in real time i guess or, or even day ahead i suppose yeah yeah um i mean there's, there's no doubt about events like storm yuri present huge challenge for grid operators they present a huge challenge for models as well to try and uh, forecast what might happen in them um i think like as i as i touched on in the presentation the energy markets are becoming more and more weather driven now the extremes like Storm Uri really set things onto another level. So it's very hard to build those in. They're, they're like the black swan events. Um, but we need to we need to deal with the uncertainty that, that weather brings with it just in on a normal day to day basis. So and that's where that probabilistic element comes into it. You have to run it's like Monte Carlo simulations, stochastic analysis, uh, and that's running thousands of simulations to try and capture it because we just don't know what what is the wind going to do on any given day um you know three weeks from now let alone three years 10 years from now so we have to try and capture all the interactions of of weather um with the traditional more traditional side of the energy market where where gas plant might kick in uh so yes and, and then how does battery storage help with that well it, like it helps but most of the assets on battery storage are two, four, maybe out to eight are at some stage, uh, you know, in the not too distant future. So they're not going to deal with events like Storm Uri with that's going to last, you know, multi-day events or multi-week events. So that would push it more into more longer term storage technologies, whatever that may evolve into. I don't know with hydrogen as a produced from wind, uh, surplus wind via electrolysis uh, would, could, could be that, but that's where this might be heading. But certainly in the in the, you know, the more immediate term, uh, battery storage really helps with, with those kind of shorter term aspects where, say, for example, a cloud might uh, come over, block the sun out, and suddenly the frequency drops on the system. Batteries can kick in to cover that. They can cover excess, as I, as I touched on, excess wind or excess solar being generated. It can be stored for later, and it, it uh, can be used then to cover peak periods more efficiently. So. Yes, like so, extreme events are are going to present challenges. There's no doubt about it. So resiliency of grids and and uh, 
you know, backup generation is, is obviously key, but energy storage will, will certainly play its part. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. And, you know, we talked about um, the role of machine learning and forecasting. I'd love to hear a bit more about that. I mean, I don't I mean, clearly we haven't got time to go into this in detail, um, but uh, as fascinating as I'm sure it would be, could we maybe just have a brief look under the metaphorical hood of these sort of technologies and techniques that drive this? And how, how are these machine learning and forecasting techniques able to be adaptive to uh, changing market rules? I mean, I don't know if that's one for you, Paul, still, again. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll take that. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, without going into the mathematics of it, well, I mean, a little bit. Um, so there's a slight difference and nuance between what we do on the long-term forecast and, and short-term forecasting models. They're similar, um, but in a, in a, we're looking for much more accuracy in the short-term side of things. So we use ensembles of, of machine learning algorithms. On the long-term modeling, we use what's called a random forest algorithm, um, something very similar in the short-term as well, but there's a, a mixture of algorithms you use to, to get a, a better result. And if I can break down what random forest means, I suppose anyone who's, well, there's two sides to it. It's a decision tree type process. So it will try and isolate the problem into a smaller set of variables. For example, it'll, it'll isolate, it'll, you know, go down a branch of say gas price less than a certain number, demand levels above a certain number. It'll go down a, a route to try and uh, make it easier to get to work out the formula of how to translate input variables into an output price. So it uses that branching technique in the first instance. And then the second side of it is regression. So anyone who's tried, who's had a, I don't know if in Excel, you've, you've tried to do a, a chart that produces a set of dots on a graph and you try and draw a straight line through it and get the formula of that line. Um, that's effectively what, what these models are doing, just, just with thousands of variables. And uh, like I said, it uses that decision tree process to, to make that problem a little bit more uh, solvable. Uh, so that's without getting too deep into the mathematics of it, which I don't think any of us want to want to go there. Andy, I think that's the the high yeah. level overview of what um, what they do in terms of how they adapt to change in market rules. So like it's, it is that kind of pattern recognition. I know like it's not uh, image images, but it sees patterns in in the data um that you know we wouldn't be able to pick up on uh so and and that's why it, you know the models need to be trained um with with historic data so and the flaw in that is that it's it's trained on historic data it can't see something that may never have occurred previously so there's obviously that element to it that is but you know that's similar to the likes of the Chat, as we all know, Chat GTP as it's taken off, um, it's only trained up to some time frame. I think in September 2021, so it's only as good as that uh, of, of the data that that it's fed. So there is that element to it. But I think, given that we've had several years of building renewables into grids at this stage, it has seen a lot of those uh, points where you know renewables might be extremely high or extremely low. It's seen a lot of that data already, um, and so it should it should be reliable to a point where I guess the next big market structural change will be the onset of that hydrogen maybe coming into the system. Uh, I think what we're gonna have is a transition phase now as we build more and more renewables in, gas will still be there as the uh, transition fuel. So it's that element, that interaction, as I touched on between where demand is, where renewables are, and where the gas plants are, that that it has had several years of, of seeing that already so uh, that should that should last for well I, i'm expecting 15 years before we get into major um hydrogen if that, if that is indeed the case of, of what the technology will be cool okay yeah yeah i mean uh so i mean but having said that uh maybe more in the day-to-day -day operation we've heard in the past uh that there's a lot of different trading strategies needed uh, to cater for the different risk appetites that investors might have. Um, so I'm just wondering how flexible optimizers like Grid Beyonds need to be in that regard and, and how that's achieved. And, and I guess, Seamus, you're the uh, the day-to-day -day trader yeah. guy. So yeah, maybe you could jump in on that one, please. Sure, yeah. So I guess 
you know, battery assets are one of the most flexible assets that you could have. So it's important not to limit their flexibility uh, any which way. So ensuring that they are um, able to trade and transact and respond in every market that they're able to provide response in uh, is important that we don't um, just pigeonhole ourselves into you know, a market that looks profitable now that we you know, are set up to trade in every market because these markets can, you know, they can change in the blink of an eye. Um, today, the value might be in RRS, but tomorrow the value could be in breakdown. So um, it's important that we're able to react dynamically. So a high level strategy is, you know, choosing energy or ancillary, um, but you can get down into more granular strategies then in terms of price and um, price taker strategies where if you're looking to sell power, um, we forecast price, probabilistic price forecasting. So we get upper bounds, lower bounds, and P50 values. So we can take price taking strategies, which would be kind of low risk, tend to suit pay as clear markets. Um, but you can also take more price chaser strategies where we price ourselves to sell as an example at P95, which tend to suit pay as bid markets. And um, so you can kind of tailor tailor trading strategies based on risk appetite or the market you're looking at, and also volume. You can you can transact volume in every market. You can tell the solver to transact volume volume in every market, or you could take it out of a market if there was clearing issues in that market, if it was um, very very volatile and was causing issues. So you could take it out of of a market. So um, a lot of the, the most important thing in terms of strategy is. We don't. Was was what? Sorry, Seamus, we missed the last bit there. The most important thing around um, strategy well, is <laughs> that we don't we don't limit ourselves at all. We don't limit ourselves. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. All right, great. So, uh, chaps, we've not got that much longer to go. So let's just do a couple more of these panel discussion questions, and then we can uh, try and tackle at least some of the audience questions. I do want to highlight though that the Grid Beyond team are will be delighted to um, field any further questions. Uh, from from the audience uh, and registrants uh, after this as well. So you can get in touch with Grid Beyond. Um, the email address would be service at gridbeyond, all one word, dot com. So that's service at gridbeyond.com. But yeah, let's uh, push on and see where we get to. So, you know, I mean, I think you did allude to this in your presentations, guys, but um, battery storage assets uh, need to be optimized to achieve the best possible blend of revenue maximization through, as you say, tracking market opportunities, um, but at the same time meeting requirements on battery health. And this all has to be done while taking a longer term view on connecting the business case for an asset today uh, with what it might be doing in the future. I'm just wondering what some of your thoughts um, around that are. Yeah, um, do you want me to take that one? Sure. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're if you're able, if you're game, yeah. So we right, we build um. Yeah. So we build all those constraints around uh, that are factored into our models around state of charge limits of the of the battery, uh, the warranty cycle limits that have, it it may be imposed on it by the the battery manufacturer. So they're all included into our. Uh, as, the, as I touched on that, that diagrammatic slide that, that showed the decision-making process for optimizing revenues, which is really the, the same decision that is applied on, on, on a trading day. Um, but it, it's all done within those constraints. And on top of that, we make estimates of the, what I call the work rates of, of the battery. Um, so as well as you know what, what it might clear in the market, but you will also be delivering possibly frequency um, and reserve uh, energy in, into the grid at a time. So there are assumptions around how how much they reg up and reg down you'll be expected to deliver or how much uh, spinning reserve you would be expected to deliver over, over any given year. So they're all factored in and uh, into the modeling. So you can see, you know, how the battery will work throughout its lifetime and how that then impacts its uh, degradation. And as you say as well, like we apply degradation curves that can be our own assumptions or those of our clients. Um, 
say battery suppliers so we, we can apply those within the modeling as well so yeah so it's very much a, a, a key aspect of of our forecast right Shame. okay so sorry wayne go on what you going to say no, Shame's described area the, 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 the kind of two-dimensional choice for traders here with a few limited resource and part of that fuel limitation is not just the capacity on the battery but but obviously how hard that battery can be or, or wants to be worked so we can do that in the long range forecast or do do that in a long range forecast as Paul described but that then feeds through into that kind of short term trading optimization as well as obviously those decisions can be dynamic but it's you know as well as kind of risk appetite for market you know is it ancillary only energy only combination of both you know, is it day ahead is it a combination of day ahead in real time but also then understanding sort of how how hard that battery only wants to optimize that battery obviously that then has, a, has, a, has an impact on degradation and, and lifetime of the battery but all of those factors are built in long term in terms of understanding that the potential returns on any kind of battery investment but then on a daily and an intraday basis <clears throat> as we trade that battery we look at state of charge state of health cycle rates um, and then in terms of what that battery can do and what position it needs to be in to participate in markets so all of all of those factors feed into to both long-term and short-term strategies sure i mean i think we had a question from an audience member and uh, forgive me i could i uh, not sure the name of the person because it's not in front of me right now but someone was asking essentially what the lifetime expected lifetime in years is of a battery storage asset and i guess the uh, the short answer is is that very much depends i suppose and it depends not just on kind of who made the batteries and how well they made them and integrated them but as you say how aggressively they're used how often they're cycled um yeah. that that's kind of thing really i guess and it's important to bear that in mind i think absolutely okay terrific so and um, yeah, i mean a lot of energy storage markets um you know we'd love it if it was all over the world but uh, energy storage markets in a lot of places are increasingly mature uh, and offer good opportunities today but we will need much 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 more storage in future so can these technologies and trading approaches uh, scale to the volumes the market needs to get to and what might that look like uh, perhaps with regard to how best assets and other resources as you might find in a virtual power plant or you know perhaps other things uh, would sit within the same customer uh, portfolio I don't know who wants to take that on Wayne I, maybe, maybe if you want to I can take the one I don't, I don't know if Seamus is able to talk at the moment I know he's still on mute so he might be having his uh, oh. some, some more audio problem no I'm here excellent So in terms of, I'll, I'll start the answer and then, then maybe Seamus can pick up from, a, from a, 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 an experienced trading perspective. But, but yeah, I'll go back to the experience of, of the kind of seven years in the UK and it sounds like a very short period of time, but it's almost forever, right, in terms of utility scale and energy storage. But, um, but in terms of you know, how markets mature, there's a, there's a dimension of this, which is that the markets do mature and the markets adapt for, for battery storage and vice versa. So, um, very early on, batteries were, were being placed into the UK market on the back of 15-year capacity market contracts and very high levels of surety over over returns over a long period of time. Um, you know, we've seen similar similar instances in Kaiser with, with with most batteries in kind of predominantly in resource adequacy. But but over time, um, as investors get more comfortable, as battery owners get more from developers and, and IPPs become more comfortable, and those assets move into into much more merchant markets, and that's where they. That's where they come into their own in terms of their speedy response and their, their absolute flexibility. So I think in terms of mar as, as one market matures, as one opportunity starts to diminish through saturation, then what happens in marketplaces is they tend to come up with other opportunities to monetize those batteries. Um, we've seen that, as I said, over six or seven years in, 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 in the UK, and we're already seeing that at, 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 at a relatively small scale in, in, in Texas right now. So as that, as that that greater scale comes in over the next two or three years, then we expect that to accelerate, as I said earlier. But, but yeah, markets adapt, opportunities adapt, funders and investors adapt in terms of expectations and, and, and on returns. Obviously, pricing of batteries come down considerably over that period of time as well, which helps with business cases. So so yeah, undoubtedly existing markets get saturated and potentially get saturated very, very quickly, but other opportunities arise and, and we see that in the Texas market with the, with the price volatility. You know, where something like an RRS or even a reg up or a reg down becomes fairly saturated fairly quickly, um, you know, those 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 energy market opportunities become more and more vital. And hitting that 40, 50, 60 hours a year with very high pricing becomes critical to business cases, and therefore 
and, and automated and robotic trading and, and, and having something which is incredibly finite in terms of forecasting becomes ever more important. So, so yeah, opportunities change, markets change, but they adapt and, and the long term case for business for, 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 for batteries changes, but it, but it continues to be strong. Seamus, is there something you want to add? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Wayne. And um, kind of further to the point I was making earlier, it's all about flexibility because you know, markets change, markets change. Today, the value might be in energy, tomorrow it could be in ancillary. Um, so you can't say for sure right now where the value is going to be in a week's time, let alone uh, a year's time. So ensuring you have the flexibility to follow that value at speed um the primary focus of, of an optimizer and, and that's the thing to, to really trans you know in, in the early days of battery storage you know 2016 2017 even in 2018 in the uk you didn't need an optimizer that would be on it's fairly straightforward in terms of what you can do with that battery um and maybe price has been similar for, 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 for the same sort of two or three year period but um as that saturation approaches as those markets change and adapt then having an optimizer, having something which is much more sophisticated than you know, a, a single or a one or two market view becomes ever more critical. And quite frankly, that's why we exist. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, those opportunities are kind of evolving, you know, not just in ERCOT, not just in the UK, but all over the world. I mean, I've noticed just in the questions tab that we've had various questions from folks interested in opportunities in Europe, uh, people looking ahead to opportunities in India as well. Uh, again, you know, we don't really have time to go through all of those now, but uh, again, no doubt Grid Beyond will be uh, happy, more than happy to continue those conversations. But let's go to the audience questions now. And thank you, everyone, for, for listening uh, to this point. We'll do a few of these questions um, before we call it the end of the session today. Um, got one here from Julian Groyer. Um, thank you for your question, Julian. Uh, asking how you take into account uh, the stochastic effect in the model so, you know, unexpected events, I suppose, uh, such as uh, an unexpected crisis in, in 2031. Uh, Paul, is that something you can uh, speak to? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I suppose we, we do that. That's that, that was the point I was making. We do that through our um, Monte Carlo simulations, stochastic, stochastic just being a, a fancy word for randomness. So we simulate uh, different weather years, we simulate different gas years. Uh, and within that, for example, 2022 would have been a good example of a crisis event. I think everyone can agree in terms of gas prices, particularly in Europe. Um, that So in how we simulate that through basically looking at the historic shape from the past uh, and feeding that into um, Again, without getting in too much into the, the mathematics of it, it's a model that employs a mean reversion with jump, it's called, is the, uh, and it employs a, a, a algorithm that's a Brownian motion. So if anyone can remember high school chemistry, it's how a gas uh, evolves through a liquid. So it's basically random motion, but not each, each next move isn't too far away from the last. That's uh, effectively how commodities are seen to operate in, in in markets and also we can employ that for wind as well solar is slightly different it requires a lot more sampling but it's a lot more the, the shape is a lot more predictable so yeah that's how we do it we 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 look at uh, 10,000 simulations and we can draw p95s p5s so high high confidence bands low confidence bands to hopefully capture the extremes to show people that, that you know, or show, show where our models um, are, where things could potentially go to. Yeah, I mean, I think one, sorry, just to be a super anecdotal here, I think one of the quirks of the ERCOT market that people aren't sure about is whether or not there's going to be, you know, several gigawatts, if not dozens of gigawatts of crypto mining going on or not, right? Uh, just being one example, I suppose, that kind of just, just adds another x into the uh, into the whole yeah and space. i suppose and, and that might be less of a random mm. event you might see that coming but mm. we can build in yeah, scenario based modeling on top of that as well so you could say you know look at high demand growth low demand growth scenarios uh, within that as well 
So I think there's okay. I think there's 32 to 35 gigawatts of, of, of applications for Bitcoin mine connections in, in, in Texas. So yeah, it's it, the randomness comes in, in what proportion that is actually gonna is actually gonna hit the ground. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So okay, pandemics and crypto, unpredictable things, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, I think just another thing that kind of joins the dots, let's say, between kind of longer term and shorter views of battery storage and, you know, their participation yeah. in markets. Um, if someone could put their notifications off there, that'd yes. be great. A uh, question here from Alex J in the audience um, asking, is it possible or even likely um, that over penetration of best projects would hurt the future profitability of merchant battery storage projects? Um, Seamus, I don't know if that's one that, that might be in your, your wheelhouse, I guess. Yeah, yeah, like it, like it is. Uh, it's a, it's a valid point. Um, the you know more and more base coming onto the system will mean more and more competition in ancillary services markets. Um, ancillary services markets are not as deep as energy markets. So as a result, um, you will see you know more price suppression, more competition in ancillary services markets, but. That just means that the value the value is elsewhere. The value is likely in the energy market. And that's what we're seeing in the UK now, where when there are the new frequency services, uh, the dynamic suite of frequency services uh, developed by National Grid came online in April of last year, and the prices were very very strong. Um, so you would have seen predominantly battery assets just in ancillary services only, not doing anything else. But over the last year. A lot of new battery generation has been built, has come online, uh, which has meant that those markets have become severely, uh, well, it's not severely pressed, but very competitive. Um, and it just means that more dynamic optimization is required, that you won't just be in ancillary services all day, but you'll have to go to energy um, and do arbitrage as well. So it just further um, promotes the requirement for a, a sophisticated solution to help you be dynamic across the market so you can't just leave it in and sort of reservice anymore and if you return the revenue you need you need to actively trade it okay terrific and you know while we've got you on the spot Seamus so there's a question here from uh, audience member DD uh, asking how you are integrating and designing the cost function into your optimization uh, using just a constant or using a variable depending on, uh, for example, current state of charge, um, battery yeah. temperature. Yeah, something you can take on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so no, it's not. It's not a constant. It's a dynamic value, and he's kind of touched on it in the question there. It is tied to state of charge, or well, it's tied to depth of discharge. So it's a function of primarily the cost of energy to charge the asset. So how much did you pay? Uh, to put power into the asset, um, less efficiency losses. So, how much are you going to lose uh, from discharging, and what's your, what's your depth of discharge? So, the depth of discharge will impact your marginal cost. So, all of those are inputs to a marginal cost calculation, which is which is dynamic, and the solver will solve the trade for anything above marginal cost. So, it'll transact on any opportunity it sees above that dynamic marginal cost. And that marginal cost can even be, you know, influenced further if we're looking at state of health in the long term. If we feel like the battery is being run too hard in, uh, from the markets that it's in, that it's not going to meet its investment horizon, we can add on margin onto marginal cost. So it effectively tells the solver, you know, we want you to transact that two, three, four dollars above marginal cost each time which has the uh, result of transacting on higher value opportunities only, but which has the effect of running the asset a little less. And um, so, yeah, the, the marginal cost is dynamic, uh, but it can also be influenced to, uh, you know, tell the solver we want to dial in the running of the, the asset for a small one. Okay, okay. And, and I mean, I can see that someone in the audience has asked, uh, so Edouard De Bruyne, thank you for your question as asking if you offer a service where you're able to simulate the business case of a battery. So I don't know if that would be some sort of digital twin type of modeling or, or what, but um, yeah, is that, 
yeah. something you guys have and what would be your views do, on yeah. you know how accurate that could be i suppose and you know what that can offer to the perspective or, or existing customer yes yeah, so what we have is um, a market simulator so what it allows us to do is or why we built it is to one demonstrate the value of our optimization capability to show how good we can trade um, an asset uh, it also allows us to um, performance or it allows us to try um, trading strategies over longer periods of time what sort of trading strategies would work best for your, your particular asset what would we recommend as a, a trading strategy but it also allows us to benchmark ourselves so we benchmark ourselves threefold we benchmark ourselves against an ancillary only strategy so if we were just to put a battery asset into rrs and leave it there you know zero optimization how much would that return for us and how much did we outperform that by that's the first level of benchmarking second we benchmark ourselves against given the given the same asset uh, how would we have traded that asset what revenue would we have returned and how much did they return and thirdly and finally kind of the final frontier in terms of benchmarking is perfect foresight so we go back in time on this day or over this period of time if we were given the exact market prices before they outturned how would we have traded you would we have returned and how close did we actually get to that so it's kind of a benchmark ourselves threefold and um, to kind of ensure we're we're pushing ourselves uh, as far as we can okay okay yeah. Yeah. and i mean that that kind of service oh sorry wayne go on if i can just step in as well alongside that kind of market simulation which is sort of more kind of looking at the short-term view we we do offer those long-range forecasts 10 15 year forecasts as well for, for, for batteries um in particular in, in Kaiser and ERCOT through Paul's team and they can be for you know investors for developers etc um we can do that at a low zone level for, for those just with an interest or we can and do do go down to, to nodal levels where we can potentially do comparisons of, of one node against another for example if, if, a, if an operator is looking at two comparative sites so yeah we offer both the, those short-term and long-term model battery models as, at various different stages and, and one would be in our kind of forecasting design service at the beginning of the process or early in the, in, in the project the other would be at the optimization side where somebody either either has an operational battery or, or wants to kind of see more detail from a, from a short-term perspective okay and i mean that that kind of service is i guess applicable both to people who are existing owners and you know people there are a lot of folks out there who are probably investing in their first battery or considering i suppose on the other hand, um, there's an, a question that come in that's just come in that's interested me a little bit from uh, Georgia Burt. So increasingly, these things will have to be done, I guess, at fleet or portfolio level. So just wondering. Uh, so the question is from your uh, George is, do you use your model also for revenue stacking across the best portfolio? Uh, I presume the answer is yes. Uh, tell me if it isn't. But I'm just wondering what the the kind of differences are in, in providing that versus you know a single asset kind of thing and is increasing i presume that fleet or portfolio level is going to become more important right yeah do you want me to pick that up guys so you know absolutely is it is becoming more important it is becoming more prevalent obviously managing a, a single standalone um asset you know is still is, is still out there and there are, there are lots of organizations that are, that are just looking at those kind of single assets but no portfolio views are becoming more and more important you know texas is a good example of, of where there is a there is a there is a different kind of marketplace for those sort of sub 10 megawatt batteries than there is for, for, for the utility scales and there are, there are less challenges let's say in, in that marketplace and that leads itself to a to a distributed portfolio of that scale of batteries for for, for many investors um lots of organizations commercial industrial organizations looking at battery storage as part of their um so the microgrid or BPP operations across across an estate. So again, those kind of distributed portfolios um, are becoming more prevalent. In terms of optimizing the individual asset, then understanding that at a kind of nodal level is, is maybe no different than managing a single asset. But the ability to the ability to kind of manage across a portfolio um, and give a portfolio wide view means that you have to you have to have the software that's that's, that's capable of doing that and giving you that kind of visibility and. And that's where somebody like like Grid Beyond who, who who manages and has managed portfolios for 15 years kind of come into that. 
terrific. Okay, um, unless anyone else has got anything to add on that point, we'll, I think we're probably going to have to call it time there, everyone. Um, I've really enjoyed this, it's been super informative working with you guys and sort of hearing your, you know, both your views on the wider market and, and kind of how, how to do things at a more granular level, I suppose you could say. Um, again, lots of great audience questions. Uh, we love to see that. Um, please do uh, send your questions in if you want to continue those. Um, you can either find the speakers via sort of LinkedIn, I guess that's how people do things these days, I guess. Uh, but also you can email Gridbeyond, you can go on the Gridbeyond website or you can email service at gridbeyond.com. Uh, and with that, I just want to thank all of our audience members, more than 400 of you logged in on the day and I'm sure plenty more will watch this on demand and on YouTube um, as those go up. And yeah, I just want to thank for all of you that are working hard within the energy transition industry or just the energy industry in general. I want to thank you for your efforts as well. And just say, yeah, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Andy, for hosting. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks. You Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, Seamus. Thanks, Paul. Goodbye, everyone. Thank mm -hmm. you.